you should do is use a Dance Dance Revolution floor lock for your data centers. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and the criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, we've got a special treat for you. David Spark from the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Series podcast joins us. We're going to play a game called The Best Worst Idea. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. It is. It's a blast. Stick around for that. So what's a con game? It's a fraud that works by getting the victim to misplace their confidence in the con artist. In the world of security, we call confidence tricks social engineering. And as our sponsors at Know Before can tell you, hacking the human is how organizations get compromised. What are some of the ways organizations are victimized by social engineering? We'll find out later in the show. All right, Joe, before we uh, dig into things here, we've got a little bit of follow-up from one of our listeners. Yep, it says, hi, team. I was disappointed when you brought up password managers without mentioning a core function that adds further protection. Basically, it checks the URL or app was pre-authorized before filling the username and password field. This means that if you click on a link in an email, don't, but everybody does sometimes, the username and password fields are only filled if you've authorized it. From this, you don't get to the point where the second factor is needed. In fact, since on my phone, where I am most likely to be fished, my device requires a thumbprint, I've essentially got three-factor authentication, password, biometrics, and one-time password. By the way, I'm amazed at how many people disappear when you tell them you are a cybersecurity analyst. Oh, well, back to my (laughs) world. Sin Ak John. Thank you, John. This is a feature of password managers I frequently forget to mention, and I think that's because my password manager actually doesn't do this. I use password safe, which is free and open source and not integrated into my browser. But John makes an excellent point. Uh, if you get one of these password managers like Dashlane or, or LastPass or one password that are integrated into your browser, they will protect you. They do provide this layer of protection by not filling out that information when you go to a phishing site because they have the record of what website you're supposed to enter this information. And when that string doesn't match you know, the domain string doesn't match, that password manager will not enter that information. It's actually kind of hard to build a password manager that's automated that won't work this way. Mm-hmm. So it's it's an added level of protection. And thank you, John, for sending that in and reminding us of that because that's another great reason to use a password manager. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Joe, well, let's get to our stories. What do you have for us this week? What is an angel investor? Hmm. You know that? It's, I'm, it's, I'm certainly I'm familiar with the term, but I don't know the history of it. Oh, well, the term actually comes from Broadway. It was I should a, know that. Yes, it was a rich person <laughs> who would start funding of plays, right? This is where the great social engineering movie, The Producers, came from. <laughs> right. <laughs> if we bilk a bunch of investors out of money and then make a play that actually has no way of being a success, then we'll get to keep the money. But that's not what we're talking about today. An angel investor is an investor that provides capital to startups early on in their in their phase in exchange for some kind of debt or usually ownership in the company. And there's a process for finding these investors. And this is a really simplified overview here. Let's say I have an idea that and maybe a prototype uh, and I want to build a company around this idea. Somehow I drum up some investors and I pitch my idea. The investors then decide if they want to invest. And if they do, Then comes this phase called the due diligence phase. This is where both sides, both me and the investor, investigate the finances of the other party and decide if we want to go further. This is how we make sure that we're not getting scammed. Sometimes investors will stipulate, however, that the startup cover the cost of the due diligence process because Hmm. that's not free. Okay. And that's where our story comes in. And my story Hmm. comes from Brian Krebs, Krebs on Security. He has the story in a couple other posts of a phony tech investor who's been bilking people out of these due diligence fees. He goes by the name John Bernard, and he tells people that he's a billionaire who made his money during the dot-com era by selling a company to GeoCities. Krebs says that Bernard is actually a guy named John Davies who has a long criminal record. The money is sent to a due diligence firm, and guess who owns that firm? (laughs) <laughs> Gee, I wonder. Yes, it's it's this Bernard <laughs> Davies guy. You know, he, okay. he, he actually owns it. He actually is the uh, domain registration as well. 
And after he gets the money for the due diligence, the investment never comes, right? Something starts happening. Like, oh, I can't do this because of my health or mm, I'm just losing interest in this investment. This is not going to happen. This is no, no, we're not going to do this. Something, something happens. In another story, Krebs has interviewed a bunch of people related to this. One of them was an investment banker who had two clients that worked with this investor, this John Bernard or John Davies. And the banker was suspicious, right? In, mm-hmm. in the process, he goes, I can't find anything about this company that he has claimed to sold. There's nothing that exists. I, I don't go ahead. Stop dealing with this guy. One of his customers listened to him, but the other one was absolutely gung ho because this guy said, I'm going to invest $10 million in your startup idea. It's a scam that's based on not greed, I would say, but more hope, right? But yeah, kind yeah. of greed. Right. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's they, money they have a dream they want to pursue and they need some help getting there. Yeah. Yeah. This investment banker said that one of his uh, one of his clients said, this guy's really interested in my idea. When you open a startup, you are really, really in. You're married to this idea. You are committed. Right. And that can make you less able to think clearly about things. Mm-hmm. particularly when mm-hmm. other people start telling you, this is a great idea. I want to give you money for it. So mm-hmm. it's a risk. Krebs has a source that estimates this guy has made off with about $30 million. Wow. Yeah. And what is a due diligence around cost? <laughs> he got one startup for a million dollars. Normally it's not really? that high, but he did get a million dollars out of one startup. Wow. <laughs> it's a lot That's of money. Amazing. It is. Now, where does that money come from? This guy's an angel investor. Maybe this wasn't the first round of funding for these folks. Maybe they uh, got built out of some other previous funding. But if not, that million dollars probably came from one of the people who started the company. Right. You know, there there are serial entrepreneurs out there who might have a million dollars to invest in this. Mm -hmm. Boy, that is fascinating. And I I say, you know, the the years that I've been around and and having uh, been involved, you know, I had had my own company for, I don't know, 20 years or so. Mm -hmm. Um, Every now and then there are people who would come around and and they want to do business with you. And, (laughs) you know, and it was, we're all going to get rich, I tell you, rich, rich, rich. And, you know, it didn't add up or just something didn't feel right. Or or, uh, or, or like this, you go down this path and at some point you say, this is not right. But it's easy to go down that path because... Everybody wants to get rich. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, uh, boy, this is fascinating. Wow. Mm. It's it's a great story. We'll put a link in the show notes. This is the latest story that he had. It came out a couple of weeks ago. But there's like two other stories he has that were previous to this. That It's a, it's a lot of reading, but man, it's fascinating. Now, is there any attempt to bring this guy to justice? I mean, is what he's doing actually illegal? Yes, what he's doing is illegal. And okay. uh, right now they're working on extraditing him from the Ukraine. Yeah, he's an international criminal mastermind right. uh, exactly. on the run, w- staying one step ahead of the law. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that is an interesting one. And like you say, uh, we'll have a, a link uh, in the show notes. How long until that one gets turned into a movie? I don't know. It's, uh, you know, like, like Catch Me If You Can. It's Right, exactly. It's a, exactly. Pretty good, it's a pretty good story. All right. Well, my story this week, uh, this comes from our buddy Graham Cluley. Uh, he was uh, writing over on the Tripwire website, and uh, it's titled, Hackers Disguise Malware Attack as New Details on Donald Trump's COVID-19 Illness. Mm. So, of course, we all know recently uh, the President of the United States was diagnosed with having covid And that is uh, very interesting. And there was all kinds of information coming out about it and all kinds of information that wasn't coming out about it, right? The White House was being a little tight with the information that they would or would not give out. And uh, this article by Graham clearly outlines how all the bad guys took advantage of that. There was a phishing campaign that's been making the rounds. This is uh, via some security researchers over at Proofpoint, which is a security company. This malware campaign claims to come from the Democratic National Committee, but of course... It does not. These these are just the the bad guys. Uh, But you'll get an email and it'll be titled something like recent info pertaining to the president's situation. Right. And then within the email itself, they have a a sample of one here. It says everything we know and what we don't about president's COVID condition. Top secret information on he a problem. I suppose it's supposed to say his problem, but you know how 
bad guys just can't seem to spell anything. Yes, and one so, thing the Democratic Party <laughs> is known for is, is typos. <laughs> right. right. Top secret information on HIA problem. Please use the password because the data is coded. Joe, you know what the password is? <laughs> I, I see the password, Dave. Very <laughs> secure password. Yeah. One, two, three. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to break that. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> it's locked up tight. So uh, they have a link to a Word document. Now, this is another part that's kind of interesting about this. That link goes to a Google Doc, which is interesting in that that in itself is not going to raise any red flags in a lot of people's email systems. Right. S- sending you a link going to a Google Doc. Well, Google's a legitimate website. Nothing, nothing bad about that. But when you go to the Google Doc, that has a link to a malicious web page uh-huh. where you would download the malware. Interesting, when you go to the Google Doc, it pops up a message that says that the file has been scanned and deemed safe. <laughs> this is the Google Doc. It has a big Google logo, the G, with all the colors on it. Yep. And it says, click here to do- download the document. The file has been scanned and deemed safe. This is a very good trick. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. all this is is a Google Doc that says everything's okay, and here's your malicious link, sir or ma'am. Right. Multiple layers here, right? Because we're playing right. off of, I think no matter what side of the aisle you come down on, you're probably interested in the intrigue about what's going on with the president, whether you love him or you hate him, and you wish him well or you wish him ill, right? Right. <laughs> you, you, want, you want the inside scoop, and so you think, ooh, this, this got accidentally emailed to me. I'll just click through and see what the real deal is, you know, the, right. the top yep. secret information. So <laughs> they've, they've set the hook with that. They've got you because you want to know something that not everyone else knows. And then you click through, and you see that this thing has been scanned by Google, and it's safe. And so off you go to where the the bad guys have their malware, and uh, it will load a version of malware that's called Bazaar Loader, which is a Trojan horse. Uh, This is from the folks who also made the TrickBot malware. Mm -hmm. And when this, it's a standard, you know, Trojan goes, goes in your system. They can steal information. It can spread across your your organization probably pull data off. It could install ransomware. Basically, it, once they're in, the options for them are are broad. Yeah, it's a kit, um, right? It's it's yeah. a dropper. That yeah, exactly. Can exactly. do whatever it wants. Yeah, a clever scam here from a number of different points of view. I mean, you you got the social engineering part where they're attracting everyone with hot news that is uh, hard to imagine hotter news than the you know, leader of the free world coming down with a potentially deadly disease, yep. right? And we talk about um, this frequently. And I've, I've even said this recently that here comes the election season, get ready for the election fishing. And then after that, it's the holiday fishing. And then after that, it's the tax fishing. Right. And <laughs> right. This is a news event that, that has happened. Look out for fishing around big news events. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. These people know that you're interested in these things. And when something big like this happens, it's going to be used as fishing lures. Well, and Graham Cluley uh, ends his article here with uh, mirroring advice that, that I know is near and dear to your heart, Joe. He says, so maybe you're wiser not to get your news tips from unsolicited emails. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Instead, seek out election-related news on the websites and TV stations of legitimate news outlets instead. Uh, Graham, right? that is sage <laughs> advice. Thank you for saying that. That's right. That's right. <laughs> By the way, if you're not familiar with uh, Graham Cluley, uh, he's got his own website. It's GrahamCluley.com, but also he's the host of the Smashing Security Podcast, which is a, a fun security podcast. Uh, if you uh, have a listen, you may even recognize some of the guests that he's had on that show. Yes. <laughs> Along with his co-host, Carol Terrio, uh, who is a regular on our show. So it's a, a small little cybersecurity world here. We all help each other out, right? Right. Yep. <laughs> all right, Joe. Well, those are our stories. It is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Rohit Shivastwa. He is on Twitter at Rohit11, and uh, we've had a story on 
from Rohit before. He received an interesting email. And because you are so good at these emails, Dave, I'm just going to go ahead and insist that you read this. <laughs> All right. Dear sir, it's really nice meeting you, sir. And it's my greatest pleasure to introduce you to this business opportunity of supplying your company Animal Vaccine from India with a huge profit net, which will be shared equally among us. I am an employee of Animal Home Zoological Ghana Limited. There is an animal drug which our company ran out of stock, which is used in production of general drugs and injection for the animals, and is only found in India since we started making use of the medicinal supplement. I only have the contact address of the local dealer in India because I worked with the former director of our company before this present one came into existence. The business deal is that, recently, I found out that this same vaccine is sold by the Indian manufacturer at the rate of 35,000 US dollars per liter to my former boss. While in my file is recorded for $65,000 per liter, that is when I discovered the business game, our former director is playing at the expense of our company. Then I also decided to take advantage of it, since I am the only person with the contact information of this same local manufacturer in India. Therefore, be rest assured, our new company chairman will be willing to buy it for $65,000 per liter as the need for the usage is rising on a daily basis and he still could not find the manufacturer. I intend to present you as a supplier who will be a middleman between our company and the local vendor in India so that my company will not know the main source of the material, meaning you will contact our company with the interest to supply this animal vaccine from India, who came across a publication in Ghana Chambers of Commerce on the urgent need for said animal vaccine. Your role must be played perfectly, and least I expect from you is betrayal. I don't want my organization to know the contact address of this local dealer in India, as well as the real cost of the product because of these personal interests. Do revert back with your interest if you can play the role, and I will forward the whole detail to you immediately. But if you're not interested, kindly indicate so that I will sort for someone else. But in case there are things you do not understand, as per my mail explanation, kindly call me so that we can express more. Yours faithfully, Dr. Isidore Yaw Jr. <laughs> this is fantastic. I love this. <laughs> Rohit has some of the greatest stuff on, uh, he's on Twitter at Rohit11. This is obviously just somebody trying to appeal to someone else's greed with a fake opportunity to make $30,000. But what's going to happen is you're going to get scammed out of whatever money you pay. Right. Uh, because this guy <laughs> is the guy selling you the leader of medicine as well. Uh, he's not the guy buying it. He's the guy collecting the money from it. Right. Yeah. You're probably going to get a, a liter of, uh, you know, saline or something. Uh, if you get anything <laughs> at all. If you get anything at all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right, right. They may not right. even go through that expense. Yeah. Well, we got his $35,000. Should we at least send him a, a liter of saline? No, that'll cost 10 bucks. No way. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, that is a good one. That's fun. And uh, that was fun to read. It was. It was great. I hope right. everybody reads their phishing emails in that voice when they're, when they're reading fish. Because that makes it, you should read every email like this, every email in that voice. So in your head, you're going, oh, this is a scam. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Every now and then I'll, I get a, I'll see a tweet or something that something comes by and people do say that they, they when they read certain things online, they hear it in my voice, which is funny. <laughs> I said, and my response is always, how do you think I feel? Because right. <laughs> I always hear my voice too. Yeah, exactly. Same, same, same. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks to uh, Rohit for uh, sending that in. That is a good one. That is our catch of the day. So let's return to our sponsor, No Before's question. Carrots or sticks? Stu Showerman, no before CEO, is definitely a carrot man. You train people, he argues, in order to build a healthy security culture. And sticks don't do that. Approach your people like the grown-ups they are, and they'll respond. Learning how to see through social engineering can be as much fun as learning how a conjuring trick works. You can hear more of Stu's perspectives in no before's weekly Cyber Heist News. We read it, and we think you'll find it valuable, too. Sign up for Cyber Heist News at knowbefore.com slash news. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash news. All 
All right, Joe, I have got a treat for us and for our audience. So joining us this week is David Spark. Security podcast listeners are probably familiar with him. He is the host of the Defense In-Depth podcast, uh, also the CISO Security Vendor Relationship podcast, and he's the producer of the Cybersecurity Headlines podcast. David, great to have you with us. It is awesome to be back again. You are going to play a game with us this week, and this is going to be great fun. So I'm just going to hand it over to you and let you describe what's going to be going on here, and we will kick it off. So, David, the the floor is yours. Excellent. Once a week, we also do something on Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific. It's our open video chat, and it's an open discussion that we have with the community, and it's a chance to have, you know, one-on-one live communication with the community. And one of the games that we play is something called best bad idea where whatever the topic may be on that week and we always have you know a a topic per week people send in their worst ideas given that topic and then what i do is i force the guests to play a game called the department of yes and we all know in security they are notoriously known as the department of no the whatever request comes in people just say no so i kind of completely flip the tables here and purposely made sure that the ideas were as bad as possible and I'm enforcing them to agree to whatever horrible idea it is. So what I'm going to do with you is I'm going to actually give you some of our winners because I do pick a winner every weekend. By the way, we get tons of submissions. I mean, between like 30 to 60 submissions on each episode. So these Mm. are grand prize winner bad ideas and (laughs) you two will be playing the department of yes to, and, and the thing is the, the way it works is you have to come up with a reason why you want to implement this horrible idea. And don't be facetious about it. Are you guys ready to play? I'm ready. I'm ready, but I'm going to have a hard time not being facetious. Oh, no, no. You, you, you can't. You, you got you to not. You got to be all on board on these ideas. All right. I'm in. I love on. the concept. All right. Here, we got a call that just came in. Hello. Welcome to the Department of Yes, where no request is ever rejected. All right, here is your first bad idea. And it comes from an episode on uh, hacking biometrics. And Will Talaba of Cognix Corporation said, what you should do is use a dance dance revolution floor lock for your data centers. Dave Bittner, why is that a great idea? Oh, this is an excellent idea. Um, First of all, uh, you can tie it into uh, HR's fitness program. So uh, perhaps you could get a, a lower insurance rate for your company because you're you're integrating uh, exercise. Everybody has to exercise in order to get in. And also, I can't think of anything uh, more individual than the way that someone dances. I love this idea. All right. Good answer, David. Joe, do you have a, a better answer? I was going to go with the uh, the nature of the timing that you could probably accurately authenticate somebody based on the timing with which they hit the buttons. So this may actually be a valid biometric method for authenticating people getting into the data center. Hooray! Excellent both. Now, I'm warning you, that was, <laughs> I, I started you off with the softball. Okay. Get harder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Here's another bad idea for both of you gentlemen. This comes from Carlotta Sage of Sage Knowledge Works. And she said, Humanize your MFA, your multi-factor authentication, by requiring people to call into the help desk just to confirm they're indeed logging in. So every login re- requires a manual process, kind of like uh, in the old days when the uh, telephone operators would patch in your uh, phone call. Uh, I'll start with you, Joe. Why is this a great idea? Well, I'll tell you, this would absolutely eliminate the need or, or the, the possibility of people logging in without authorization. Uh, The fact that the process is that I have to call in to the help desk and say, I'm going to log in now. If the help desk sees me trying to log in or somebody sees me trying to log in without that call to the help desk, then they know that that login attempt is inauthentic and they can deny it. but But hold on. We have a whole world of social engineering where people are spooked. I mean, this is your entire show. Couldn't that be spooked right there, Joe? This seems a pretty obvious spoof. 
Yeah, but it's the timing. Well, oh, okay, wait a minute. No, 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 wait. You're right. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> oh, did you, you failed, David. You first, go. I'm the first loser uh, on the show. <laughs> David, I, I, I love this idea. First of all, uh, it's better for uh, the, the the communications of your company by having people actually speak to each other rather than being faceless people throughout the company. You're, you'll build the, uh, the trust, the companionship throughout the organization. So I think you can't underestimate the value of that. The other thing I would say is that it's good for everybody to slow down. In these modern times when everyone's moving so quickly, to slow things down, let people stop and smell the roses, uh, it's probably good for everyone's mental health in these challenging times. The much better answer. Joe, pay attention to your partner here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Now, Sorry, everybody. Sorry. This, this was, don't apologize. Just <laughs> come back on the next round. All right. All right. All right. All right this one was on uh, an episode on uh, hacking third uh, party vendors. And when we say hacking, we don't mean we're going to actually hacking. We, it's, we use hacking in the term of um, uh, we're going to spend an hour critically thinking about how do we deal with third party vendors. So this was uh, the bad idea on this one. I'll throw it to you first, David. Mm. This comes from Sean Bowen, who's actually a CISO of it, over at Restaurant Brands International. And he said, select the vendor that has been breached the most. They clearly have the most lessons learned. Why is that a good idea to select that specific vendor? This is an excellent idea. In fact, it reminds me of a, a, a friend of mine uh, who uh, like to uh, imbibe a, a drink or two. And uh, when confronted by his colleagues as to, uh, you know, if he could drive home safely, he would say, well, who are you going to trust? Someone, he says, someone who has a lot of experience driving drunk or someone who has no experience driving drunk? Uh, <laughs> that sounds like sage advice. <laughs> oh, there's that facetiousness coming through. <laughs> yeah, he's, well, he's made it this far, and obviously, uh, yeah, bad advice. Don't drive drunk. But, um, <laughs> but I think there's something case, to this. I think there's something to this because that vendor is going to be on the lookout for every possible thing. They're going to have a high level of paranoia. They're going to be stopping and looking at everything coming their way because of uh, the trauma that they have experienced from being breached so many times. Oh yeah. <laughs> High level of paranoia. I like that answer. That's 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 what puts you over the top there, David. Joe, your turn. Select the vendor that has been breached the most. They clearly have the most lessons learned. That's, Why is this the vendor you're going to choose? That's right. This is a lot like getting on the plane of the airline that just had the latest air accident. It, it's kind of what Dave is saying, <laughs> that you get on that plane because they're the ones paying attention to what's going on. Uh, they do have the most lessons learned. But additionally, in addition to that, their reputation may have been damaged and they may actually be the lowest price vendor available. Oh! <laughs> Ooh, I did not even consider that one. Excellent. You you literally just <laughs> tipped yourself over the head. So actually, because of that, I'm going to actually give the win to Joe over David. Oh, yeah, I like it. They're hungry for your business. That's <laughs> right, Joe. That's good. <laughs> All right. There they we need go. to redeem themselves. This one... I'm going to be impressed if you guys can handle this one. And I, I want mm. you to know that this one comes from pretty much our all-time winner. This guy has won about seven times the Best Bad <laughs> Idea Award. So he always, and he, I think, really hit it out of the park with this one. And this was on Hacking Healthcare was the episode. And it comes from Dutch Schwartz with Amazon Web Services. And he said, quote, parents listed on patient records are randomized. You are randomly assigned kids and must raise them for the next 30 days. Joe, why is this the idea you want to implement? Oh, can I have a second to think about this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's why you want to implement the randomization of the children that you have to care for. Uh, this will actually make society better off overall. It's a societal goal. If, uh, if everybody is involved randomly in the raising of other people's children, then the the benefit that those children receive by being exposed to different parenting techniques and different healthcare uh, decisions being made, then the diversity of thought and and care and process will uh, positively impact society down the road. Yes, that is an <laughs> excellent answer, Joe. I am quite <laughs> impressed with that. Really good job. All right, Dave, you're going to have to be able to uh, uh, beat him on that one. That's a good answer. Well, 
<laughs> All right, I agree. But I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to go with that which does not kill me makes me stronger. And, <laughs> and I'm going to I'm going to go down way, the that path. Could be the answer. Let me just say that could be the answer for all these bad ideas. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. That's true. But I'm going to go with uh, um, increasing the if just from the healthcare point of view of increasing the variety of germs in your household. And and uh, because if you're if you're dealing well, with your on, family, some other, uh, somebody else's kid is has, is with riddled with germs. Of course. Well, okay. different germs. Different Everybody's, germs. Everybody's, first of all, David, everyone's kid is riddled with germs. Absolutely. Anyone, <laughs> anyone who's had a child in, yes. in daycare, which, which we refer to as the Petri dish, comes home <laughs> covered in spit and snot. So <laughs> there's that. So I think by, uh, by, uh, by broadening the, the spectrum of uh, pathogens that you bring into your house, you will uh, increase the capability of your own immune system to, to battle those things, thereby making everyone more healthy all right well killing, i will give killing you off the week too don't forget that <laughs> killing off the week too right? all right well i will give you oh, yes, sir! i'll give it to you that all right let me give you your very last one are you guys ready right. for this this one Absolutely. yes i'm yes. gonna go so far as to say i think this might have been an audience favorite an all-time audience favorite because this one this one was pretty impressive and this one was on hacking passwords and while we got a lot of people saying you know change everyone's password to the same password this one I thought was mo the most creative, and it comes from Philip Bayer of Global Payments, and he said, your password can only be the name of your dog. If your password is compromised, you have to change the name of your dog. David, why <laughs> is this a great idea? Oh, boy. <laughs> if your password is compromised, you have to change the name. Do I get to change my password, too, or just the name of the well, dog? Right. So, well, well, both have to be changed because I see. everyone names gives their password as their, their pet's name. And I see. You know, inevitably, it's going to be compromised. So both have to be changed. Right, right. Okay. Uh, well, it's good to keep your pets on their toes. Uh, you don't want to, your dog. <laughs> you don't want your dog to uh, to to get lazy. Uh, so you you want to keep them sharp, especially as they get older. I have a dog. It's he's an older dog, and so he's kind of set in his ways. You can't, you know, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. This could counter that by by changing the dog's name. The dog would have to realize that to get the things that the dog wanted, uh, that dog would have to recognize the new name, uh, thereby uh, increasing the, the dog's uh, engagement and uh, happiness in your family. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> All right. I'm just giving you a soft win on that. <laughs> All right, Joe, uh, why okay, is this a great I idea? I am also a dog owner, uh, but we, when we name our dogs, we pick something clever, right? Something uh, very funny, we think. Uh, like my current dog, but she is a young dog. She's a little over a year old, but her name is Josie. And the reason we named her Josie is because we have also three cats. So it's Josie and the Pussycats. Right. Oh God. So my pet. Is, okay. <laughs> That's a bad joke, right? <laughs> I love it though. But wouldn't it be better if when the joke got old, I could also change the dog's name. So maybe I pick a new name for my dog. That's just as every bit as clever, but uh, I don't have to stick with the same name, Josie, uh, for Josie and the Pussycats for the next 16 to 20 years, however long my dog's going to live. Oh, no! <laughs> I'm sorry, Joe. That's not I a good was, one? Uh, <laughs> no, he, David barely squeaked out a win on this one. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, All right, guys, that, uh, thank you, by the way, uh, yeah. for playing along. Um, by the way, if the audience ever wants to play, they can participate in our, our weekly video chats that happen yes, every Friday. Yes, how do they do that? Uh, every Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, they happen pretty much all Fridays. Like, I think the next one we won't have it will be the one after Thanksgiving. But after that, they're every Friday. And you just go to CISOseries.com. There's a button right at the top that says register for video chat and that's how you can participate and i do actually give a, an amazon gift card out to the winner uh again purely my judgment of who i think is the best <laughs> bad idea and also i create a, like a little graphic for them that uh, lets them know that they won the best bad idea as well all right with their that's actual awesome. bad well, idea well great fun uh david spark thank you so much for joining you, us yeah do check Thanks. it out uh, we appreciate it And of course, we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fishtest. Think of Know Before for your security training. 
All right, everyone. Well, that is our show. Of course, we want to thank all of you for listening. And we want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thank you.